now it's time for RTB 101, where we discuss practical questions to equip you to share your faith more effectively. And here to help me talk about a very common evidence for biological evolution is Dr. Fuzz Rana. Welcome back, Fuzz. Hey, Krista. How are you? Great. It's great to have you here. And we're going to be talking about something called pseudogenes. Now, I have to admit, this is a little topic is uh, something I don't know a ton about, but I do know that it's often put forth as an evidence for common descent. So maybe you can help us walk through it a bit. Uh, maybe we should start with what is a pseudogene? Yeah, well, a pseudogene is one among several different distinct classes of what's called junk DNA. Uh, and uh, the idea of junk DNA has been really part of the construct of biology for several decades, but it really came to the, the forefront in 2000 with the sequencing of the human genome. And at that time, uh, when people analyzed the initial genome sequence, they concluded that roughly 2 to 5% of the human genome consisted of functional DNA, and the rest was junk. And that junk consisted of a large number of different classes of, of junk DNA, including pseudogenes. And pseudogenes comprise about 2% of the human genome and are believed to be the leftover remnants of um, uh, one-time functional genes that have undergone such severe mutation that they no longer are functional or can arise through other types of biochemical mechanisms. And in fact, there are three different types of uh, pseudogenes, unitary pseudogenes, duplicated pseudogenes, and processed pseudogenes. Uh, that again are believed to be the leftover remnants of one-time functional genes that again have undergone mutational change. That's a good little kind of crash course into what pseudogenes are. Maybe we can talk about how these pseudogenes are used as evidence for biological evolution. When you know, if we're running into them, maybe in an evolutionary textbook or classroom context. Yeah, well, uh, the, the reason why many people see pseudogenes as evidence for evolution are, are twofold. One is because when you think about the human genome, the fact that it's comprised of such a vast amount of so-called non-functional DNA, that right away to a, a skeptic suggests that this cannot be the product of a creator. Why would a creator create the human genome with so much useless non-functional DNA? But then on top of that, when you look at uh, the distribution of pseudogene sequences in the human genome compared to the genomes of the great apes like chimps, orangutans, and gorillas, what you discover is that there are uh, pseudogenes that have nearly identical sequences uh, in both uh, chimps and in humans. They occur in the same region, the corresponding regions of the genomes, and therefore it looks as if, again, these pseudogenes are shared between humans and the great apes. And, and for an evolutionary biologist, the argument would be that these pseudogenes must have arisen in the shared ancestor of humans and chimps and then were retained as evolutionary processes generated these two diverging evolutionary lineages. And so they see the shared pseudogene sequences as evidence of a shared evolutionary ancestry. How do we make sense of pseudogenes in light of our testable creation model strategy here at Reasons to Believe? Well, one of the things that is really exciting to me is that in the last uh, couple of decades now, there have been a, a mounting set of discoveries that indicate that virtually every class of junk DNA actually has function, including pseudogenes. Uh, and in, in fact, we're, as we continue to study pseudogenes, we're learning that these uh, DNA sequence elements have an increasing suite of functionality. Uh, and it turns out that the similarity of these sequences to the sequences of genes makes perfect sense as we begin to understand the functional role that pseudogene play, pseudo, pseudogenes play. All this to say is that once you recognize that pseudogenes actually are functional, this then makes it possible to view them as essentially part of the design of the human genome. And therefore, you would see the shared pseudogene sequences as reflecting shared design or common design as opposed to providing evidence for common descent. Uh, and that the genome no longer looks like it is a hodgepodge uh, 
production of evolution, but rather it looks as if it's an elegantly designed complex biochemical system that is befitting of the, the creator's handiwork. So that makes me wonder if as scientists look into pseudogenes more and more, if it you think that that argument is going to kind of diminish in its frequency that people won't be putting it forward anymore as an evidence for evolution because as we're discovering this functionality, maybe it, it's a little bit rougher fit for the evolutionary paradigm. Yeah, I mean, at minimum right now, the way things stand is that both a, an evolutionary framework and a creation model framework can actually account for um, for the existence of pseudogenes and, and other junk DNA sequences uh, in the human genome. So in a sense, it, it, it is a standoff, really, uh, that, that what was once considered to be uh, an open and shut case for evolution now is not that so much whatsoever, but rather the best evidence for evolution can be readily accommodated in a creation model framework. That's very interesting. And it makes me wonder then, when I'm in a conversation with my non-Christian friends, um, why is this discussion about pseudogenes important? Maybe how can it help me in sharing my faith? Yeah, well, I meet so many people who adopt this mindset that if evolution can explain everything in biology, then there really is no need for a creator whatsoever. And so for some people, the, the veracity of evolution is a reason to reject a, a creator's existence and role in the origin and the design of life. And so in my experience, you need to be able to counter that perspective, helping those people to realize that maybe there's an alternative way to view biological designs other than from within an evolutionary framework, one that employs a creator. Also, many people will look at pseudogenes as being essentially, again, junk, and, and then question whether or not a creator could be responsible for creating a genomes that are riddled with non-functional DNA sequences. Again, they would argue that it makes more sense that this is the product of evolution, not the handiwork of a creator. But as we're learning that junk DNA, including pseudogenes, has function, our view of the human genome is radically changing to a very sophisticated biochemical system, again, the fitting of a creator's handiwork. So we need to be able to counter both of those perspectives and, and the insights that we're developing into pseudogenes and other sequences of junk DNA allow us to do that. Well, thank you, Fuzz. That was a very helpful discussion. And I do want to encourage you, go check out Fuzz's blog, The Cell's Design. It's at reasons.org. <laughs>